Imagine flying alone for over 14 hours non-stop across the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean in a small, single-engine aircraft. All around you, there's nothing but the endless blue of the ocean stretching to the horizon. You attempt to establish contact with your destination airport, but there's no response. Gradually, the realization sinks in. You are lost, stranded in the middle of nowhere, navigating the skies in a compact Cessna ag plane designed primarily for agricultural purposes, and you are completely lost. This is the story of Jay Prochnow's harrowing delivery of a Cessna 188. Three days before Christmas in 1978, Jay Prochnow, a former US Navy pilot, set out on a challenging journey across the Pacific Ocean. His mission was to ferry a Cessna 188 Agwagon, a single-engine crop duster aircraft, from California to Australia. On this leg of the trip, he took off from Pago Pago in American Samoa, aiming for Norfolk Island, a small island located several hundred miles north of New Zealand. Jay Prochnow's background and training reflected a career rooted in aviation expertise and military service. He served as a pilot in the United States Navy. His experience in the Navy provided him with rigorous training in aviation, navigation and operational procedures, which proved invaluable during his later civilian endeavors. After his military service, Prochnow pursued a career in civilian aviation where he applied his skills as a pilot. As a former Navy pilot, Prochnow underwent extensive training in flight operations, navigation, emergency procedures, and aerial maneuvers. This training equipped him with the capability to handle challenging situations such as navigating over long distances and managing aircraft in adverse weather conditions. All skills that he would call up on this fateful day the distance between Pago Pago and Norfolk Island was 1,475 nautical miles, a journey expected to take approximately 14 hours. Despite the aircraft's relatively modest range as a crop duster, the Cessna had a fuel endurance of around 22 hours, providing a safety margin for the long flight over open ocean. Toward the latter part of his flight, Jay Prochnow picked up the low-frequency beacon at Norfolk Island on his automatic direction finder. ADF. Encouraged by the ADF needle pointing straight ahead, he believed he was on the final stretch of his journey. However, as time passed, Norfolk Island failed to appear. Assuming stronger than anticipated headwinds, Prochnow continued onward. But soon the ADF needle began to swing and drift unpredictably. Attempts to tune into other beacons resulted in similar erratic readings, revealing that the ADF had malfunctioned and Prochnow was lost. Realizing he did not know where he was, a dire situation when flying over the vast Pacific Ocean in a crop duster, Prochnow relied on his Navy training to perform a square search pattern in hopes of locating the island. Despite his efforts, he remained lost and increasingly anxious. In desperation, he sent out a mayday call to air traffic control in Auckland using his high-frequency HF radio, declaring a serious emergency and hoping for a lifeline. As the day drew to a close and the sun began to set, Jay Prochnow faced a dire situation. Flying a crop duster over the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, he considered the grim possibility of ditching his plane into the sea while there was still enough light to execute the maneuver safely. The risks of ditching were immense. The chances of survival in such an emergency landing were slim, given the remote location and the rough waters of the ocean. Prochnow had been airborne for nearly 20 hours, far exceeding the time he had anticipated for the journey to Norfolk Island. His aircraft, a Cessna 188 Aguagon, was not designed for long overwater flights and was now running dangerously low on fuel. The situation was becoming increasingly desperate. Prochnow's initial confidence, bolstered by his previous experience as a US Navy pilot, was now overshadowed by the stark reality that he was lost in one of the most isolated parts of the world. The uncertainty of his position and the malfunctioning of his automatic direction finder, ADF, had left him disoriented and anxious. Despite his efforts to conduct a square search pattern, he had been unable to locate any land or landmarks that could guide him to safety. Each passing minute brought him closer to the harsh decision of whether to attempt a potentially fatal ocean landing or continue the search for a safe landing spot. Prochno's high-frequency, HF radio, was his lifeline, 
and his mayday call had alerted Auckland air traffic control to his plight. The controllers, recognizing the urgency of the situation, had reached out to the nearest aircraft capable of assisting in the search. The clock was ticking and Prochnow's hopes rested on the slim chance that someone could find him before his fuel ran out and the darkness of night enveloped his tiny plane. On the same day, an Air New Zealand DC-10, commanded by Gordon Vett with First Officer Arthur Dowie as his co-pilot, had taken off from Nandi in Fiji en route to Auckland. Auckland Air Traffic Control identified their aircraft as the closest to Prochnow's Cessna and reached out for assistance. After consulting with his passengers, Vetter agreed to divert and join the search for the missing pilot. With both Vetter and Dowie holding navigation licenses and the DC-10 carrying extra fuel reserves, they had the capacity to assist in the search. The aircraft was equipped with three inertial navigation systems, providing the necessary technology and resources to aid in locating Prochnow amidst the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean. But would it be enough to locate and assist Prochnow? Around this critical juncture, Gordon Vett managed to establish radio contact with J. Prochnow's Cessna. Recognizing the urgency of the situation, Vetter initiated a series of navigational maneuvers to determine their relative positions. First, Vetter instructed Prochnow to turn his aircraft towards the setting sun and report his heading. Prochnow reported a heading of 274 degrees magnetic. Vetter performed the same maneuver in his DC-10 and established a heading of 270 degrees. This crucial information revealed that the Cessna was positioned to the south of the DC-10. Understanding their relative positions provided a glimmer of hope. Vete's experience and quick thinking were pivotal in this moment. By coordinating their efforts and using the setting sun as a navigational reference, Vete and Prochnow began the complex process of narrowing down the Cessna's location over the vast Pacific Ocean. Next, Gordon Vete asked J. Prochnow to place his hand on the instrument panel and count the number of fingers between the horizon and the center of the sun. Prochnow reported that the sun was four fingers above the horizon. Vetter repeated the exercise from his flight deck and determined the sun's elevation to be two fingers. Since the sun appeared higher to Prochnow, this indicated that the Cessna was closer to the sun, or west of the DC-10. Vetter calculated that each finger represented an angle of just over two degrees, with each degree translating to 60 nautical miles. By this method, he estimated that the Cessna was approximately 240 nautical miles to the southwest of the DC-10. This innovative method of celestial navigation was crucial. By using the sun's position relative to the horizon as a reference, Vetter was able to narrow down Prochno's location despite the vastness of the Pacific Ocean. Soon after this, the DC-10 established VHF contact with the Cessna. Prochnow was instructed to fly due east towards the DC-10. Gordon then had another innovative idea. He realized that the VHF link could be used to pinpoint the Cessna's location. He asked Prochnow to orbit and keep talking over the radio. Gordon knew that the VHF range circle had a diameter of 400 nautical miles. By flying the DC-10 across this circle, he could identify the points where he made and lost contact with the Cessna. After losing contact at a point, he turned 90 degrees to the left and started flying in a box pattern, also known as an oral box pattern, to further refine the search area. This method leveraged the VHF range to methodically narrow down Prochnow's position. By using the points of contact and loss of contact, Gordon could create a more accurate map of the Cessna's location. After flying along this new leg for a sufficient period, Gordon Vett made a left turn, followed immediately by another left turn, each turn being 90 degrees. He continued flying until contact with the Cessna was lost again. Next, Gordon drew two lines perpendicular to the cords he had flown within the VHF range circle. The intersection of these lines should have marked the center of the range circle and thus the approximate location of the Cessna. However, upon checking this point, the Cessna was not found there. This discrepancy was likely due to minor timing errors in the execution of the oral box procedure. As the sun was setting on that fateful day, 
Vetter seized upon another innovative approach to locate the Cessna. He recognized the potential of using the timing of sunset as a navigational tool. This method involved comparing the precise moment the sun disappeared below the horizon at Norfolk Island with the time observed aboard J. Prochnow's Cessna, taking into account the altitude difference which affects the sunset time. Given the altitude variation, Prochnow would witness the sun setting slightly later than observers at sea level. The difference in sunset times between Norfolk Island and the Cessna was calculated to be 22.5 minutes. In terms of longitude, where each degree equates to four minutes in time, this translated to approximately 5.6 degrees of difference. Utilizing the known geographic coordinates of Norfolk Island, Vetter and his crew employed this time differential to estimate the Cessna's position. Their calculations determined that the Cessna was situated approximately 291 nautical miles east of Norfolk Island at that moment. Prochnow followed the instructions to fly northwest as directed. By this time, the Cessna had been airborne for over 20.5 hours and was running critically low on fuel. Then, a stroke of luck. Prochnow spotted an oil rig being towed below. They immediately radioed their coordinates to the DC-10 crew, who swiftly adjusted their course towards the Cessna. A passenger aboard the DC-10 was the first to spot the Cessna. At this point, they were less than 150 nautical miles away from Norfolk Island. Gordon Vett radioed Prochnow with a magnetic heading of 294 degrees to guide him towards safety. Jay Prochnow executed the landing skillfully, touching down safely close to midnight after more than 23 hours in the air. He managed to stretch his 22-hour fuel endurance through precise use of cruise control, ensuring a successful conclusion to the harrowing ordeal over the Pacific Ocean. Vetter's problem-solving techniques were definitely worth being examined. In the dramatic rescue of Jay Prochnow, the operation faced potential errors that highlighted the complexities of aviation navigation and location determination. Oral boxing, a technique heavily reliant on continuous VHF radio transmission, was crucial for establishing and maintaining contact between Prochnow's Cessna and Captain Gordon Vetter's DC-10. However, any interruptions or periods of silence during transmission could have been misinterpreted as a loss of contact, emphasizing the need for meticulous recording of when communications were initiated and lost. Even slight timing discrepancies in these observations, exacerbated by the aircraft's high ground speed of approximately 600 knots, could lead to significant errors in pinpointing the Cessna's location relative to the DC-10. Another critical factor was the method used to determine the Cessna's longitude through observations of sunset times. This method required accurate knowledge of the aircraft's latitude at the time of observation. In the region where the rescue took place, the local mean time of sunset changes by about 13 minutes per 5 degrees of latitude. Therefore, a small error in estimating the latitude, even by 1 degree, could result in an uncertainty of approximately 33.8 nautical miles in determining the Cessna's longitude. This sensitivity showed the precision required in using sunset observations for navigation purposes. These challenges highlighted the intricate planning and execution involved in rescue missions, where innovative navigational techniques and precise coordination among aircraft, ground control and rescue teams were imperative. Captain Vett's strategic use of oral boxing and sunset observations, despite their potential sources of error, ultimately played pivotal roles in successfully locating and guiding Prochnow's Cessna to safety. Captain Gordon Vetter's decision to jettison fuel under the assumption he was in visual range of J. Prochnow's Cessna shows the intricate nature of search and rescue missions conducted over expansive oceanic regions. Despite Vetter's meticulous calculations and reliance on the HF line of position, he speculated that Prochnow's visibility might have been obstructed by the Cessna's opaque canopy, thus preventing him from spotting the DC-10. J. Prochnow undoubtedly owed his life to extraordinary luck and the fortuitous arrival of Gordon Vett. Few DC-10 pilots on a rescue mission could have performed the series of life-saving feats that Vett did. Vetter was not just a pilot, he was a navigational magician, a masterful airman whose actions exemplified inspirational improvisation each problem met with an ingenious solution. Do you agree? Let us know in the comments.